Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you, Kathy. Um, Let me start off by thanking the committee for giving me this opportunity to um, share something with you that's particularly important in my sobriety today, emotional sobriety. Um, How was the banquet? Because it feels like you've just finished the banquet, and this is the main speaker. There's a lot of people here today. Anyway, um, I, I'm deli- I really am delighted to be here. Uh, as I said, this is, you know, I've, I've had some challenges throughout my recovery, and it's, it's really been a journey. <clears throat> and a lot of the things that people told me when I first came into AA, and I thought they were full of it, and I didn't understand, yes. they were all pretty, pretty spot on with everything. Um, so I'm going to share some of that with you today. Uh, but first, let me tell you a little bit about me. I am, uh, yeah, I won't tell you how old I am. You can figure that out. But I uh, got sober in um, 2002, December of 2002, and um, came out of recovery, joined the Welcome Group, and I've been a member of the Welcome Group since then. Uh, I still have the same sponsor. Uh, I still go to meetings on a regular basis. I sponsor young men, old men, and um, I try to share my experiences with them. I'm still active in service. I'm still active in meetings. Um, I do the best that I can. It's not always great every week, but I do the best I can. Um, to start my my share on emotional sobriety, I just wanted to share a few definitions with you so it would give some context to the story that I'm going to share with you. So the first uh, definition is, what is a spiritual awakening? And Carl Jung described the process as coming back to one's original self through a journey of self-discovery. You become willing and begin to clear certain things out of your life, habits, relationships, old belief systems, etc. So that's the first uh, um, definition. Second one is spiritual experience. I strongly believe that we have a spiritual awakening and then we have a series of spiritual experiences on our journey that further uh, deepen our spirituality and our recovery. So spiritual experience is an event or a series of events causing me to change the way I see myself others, and the world. AA's definition of a spiritual awakening is a profound personality change sufficient to bring about recovery from alcoholism. And last, but no, not last, but if I look at what emotional sobriety is, it says, being comfortable, comfortable being present with all of my feelings without any of them defining or controlling me, life on life's terms, without extreme or inappropriate reactions, balance, Calamity with serenity. The last uh, definition I'll share is ambiguity. Uh, This is something I learned in therapy, and I'll get into more detail on that in one of my experiences. But the definition I'm going to use for ambiguity is gray, not black or white. Not everything in life is black or white. Often there's a gray area. So I'll share more about that once I get going. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to uh, use the traditional AA experience of sharing what it was like, what happened, and what it's like today, with a little bit of a twist. Um, so what was I like? Well, I was very self-centered, selfish, self-seeking, full of fear, all the things that we hear about today. The challenge for me was I was completely unaware of it. I've only become aware of that once I got into recovery. So I was completely unaware of what I was doing. I thought you were the problem. The world was the problem. And I also thought that I needed to insulate myself from the world and build a persona to protect myself. So that's that's what I was like, one of the ways I was like. 
The other thing that I learned in, in AA is that I never liked where my feet were. It's an expression I stole from someone else. So what that meant to me was no matter where I was, no matter how I was feeling, no matter what I was doing, I wanted to be someplace else. And that created significant challenges in my life. But again, I wasn't aware of it. I also suffered from something called immediate gratification, which maybe some of you can relate to. For me, I, I, I didn't understand the concept of delayed gratification. Immediate gratification for me meant I want it all. I want it all the time, and I want it right now. So it kind of goes with the idea of not liking where my feet are. I don't like this feeling I've ha I'm having. I don't want it. I want to change that, and I need to change it immediately. So I couldn't sit in any of the discomfort I was feeling. The only way I could deal with it was to drink or to act out. So that's kind of <clears throat> what I was like. And the last thing I'll mention on that was all of the above created this perception that I needed all those things in order for me to be okay. The only way I was going to be okay is if all of these things fell into place. I could change where I was, etc. So that's what I was like. What happened? Well, at the ripe old age of 50, I hit a bottom, an emotional bottom. It wasn't a physical bottom. Uh, I didn't have to be rushed to, to emergency. I just hit an emotional bottom. Uh, <clears throat> I had no idea where to turn. My sister uh, got me into a treatment center, and I spent uh, about 10, 12 weeks in a treatment center and uh, got introduced to AA, and I said, yeah, that's, that's good for all of you folks, but I don't have a drinking problem. You know, I was the kind of drinker that could say no. I was the kind of drinker that could have one drink. But I never knew when that was going to happen. And if I was feeling uncomfortable, it was a good chance I was going to go to town. And I usually did. So I hit the bottom um, and uh, got introduced to AA. And I was in denial about my alcoholism. At least the drinking part of it. That's what I thought alcohol, alcoholism was, drinking. And I thought my problem was with relationships because it was a relationship that took me out. Another failed relationship that had no chance for success whatsoever to begin with. A relationship with a woman half my age. So all my previous relationships were functional woman, dysfunctional me. Functional, dysfunctional, functional, dysfunctional. The relationship with this young woman was dysfunctional, dysfunctional. And it was a disaster. And it drove me to my bottom. So I'm going through recovery through the treatment center and um, denial about drinking. But one thing that was good about that was I get introduced to AA and the seed was planted. Or it was about to be planted. Because I'm still not sure. I don't believe it was truly planted and embedded me in recovery. I get out of recovery, join the welcome group, um, got active, as active as you can be. I just needed to be there. I couldn't. Uh, I, I couldn't. I couldn't stop vibrating from my emotions. And and um, anyways, I had a relapse as a result of the last relationship. Um, pretty bad one. <clears throat> but I did come back five months later. So I came back in May. So my actual dry date is May 8th, 2003. Um, and I, I, I said, okay, I'm an alcoholic. I, get, I have to get focused on AA and recovery. So the first thing I did was said, I got this. I know what the problem is. And what do you think I did? I said, well, I've got the car, I've got the cottage, I've got the fancy sports car, I've got the good job. What's missing? A woman. So I got into a relationship and I took a hostage for five years. And she was an amazing woman. Amazing woman. She wasn't one of us at all. Uh, mother of four, just an amazing woman. And I kept falling back on my old ways and in... And the relationship was was doomed. 
because I wasn't capable enough to see that this was never about my drinking. This was about me, and I needed to change. And what I've grown to learn about recovery over time, emotional recovery, is that it has nothing to do with alcohol. This is all about me changing. The spiritual awakening, the spiritual experiences, all of those things are about change. If I just don't drink and I continue to act and behave the way I, I did, I'm in trouble. So anyways, the relationship ended, and I went into the tank emotionally, same way I had done in my previous umpteen relationships. And for two years, I suffered with this um, emotional discomfort. So that was my first personal loss. Took the hostage, a lot of anxiety. Seven years of sobriety, I'd had enough, and I believe I had my first spiritual experience. And I got reintroduced to the steps with my sponsor. And I get introduced to the con I get reintroduced to the concept of a higher power, <clears throat> and reintroduced. Maybe I just heard it for the first time, and I came to this sense that you know what, I'm going to be okay. No matter what happens, I'm going to be okay. In the past, I always try to find a way to get them back, and it never worked. Or they'd come back, and then I say, "Oh shit, what have I done? They're back." So. It was the first time I'd ever in my life felt that even though this is uncomfortable, even though I don't like this, I'm going to be okay. So that was my first spiritual experience. And I'm going to share a number of spiritual experiences over my recovery and, and um, in the attempt to, to share where I'm at with, uh, with emotional sobriety. So that was at seven years. Ten years of sobriety, I had a medical emergency. And although it was not life-threatening, it was pretty close. And um, that turned out to be my second spiritual experience. And I, you know, I, it, it, it got complicated and I had to go back in for surgery a second time and I lost about 30 pounds and I looked in the mirror and I was in intensive care for two weeks and I looked in the mirror and I, and I looked like an, an, sorry if there's any 85-year-old gentleman in here, but I looked old. And I thought, oh my God, this is what lies ahead for me. This is what the future holds for me. I need to do something about this. So I, I learned something from that, and it's further cemented the idea of change. Twelve years into, into recovery, I had my third spiritual experience. Um, and I lost my dog. So... <clears throat> I'm a big U2 fan, and my dog's names, I had two dogs. My dogs were named Bono and Edge. Aww. And so Bono passed away. And I guess I was at that place from a recovery, from a whatever perspective, it hit me really hard, but I was okay with it. Like I, I went to my yoga class, and I'm lying on the mat, and I just burst out crying. It was kind of embarrassing, but I was okay with the way I was feeling. I learned about grieving, and I learned about loss. First time in my life. In, in the past, the way I dealt with loss and with grieving, I would drink my way through it, and that would get me through 24, 48 hours. So that was a pretty profound experience for me. In, and, and the other thing that I learned from that is I learned about true love. Probably the most powerful thing. So fast forward 15 years sobriety, um, I found myself in a, um, uh, in a lawsuit. And I was the plaintiff in the lawsuit. So I initiated the lawsuit. And I was suing a client. This brings into the into the question into into question the concept of ambiguity, black or white. I always saw things as I'm right, you're wrong. I can't be wrong. If I'm wrong, I've got to go to war with you to win. And that's kind of what I did in this situation. And it went through small claims court, 
and it took two and a half years, and I was I had this resentment for two and a half years. There was lots of uh, examples where I thought, yes, we're going to win, we're going to win, we're going to win. They ended up spending a, an enormous amount of money, more than what the lawsuit was for, in defending themselves. And um, in the end, they ruled in their favor, and I couldn't believe it. And I was devastated for a little while. But what happened was I was, you know, I start, I, I, I spoke with my sponsor and I spoke with my therapist and I was able to see their side of it. They thought they were right. I thought I was right. So <clears throat> where is the middle ground in there? And maybe middle ground is a better place to be than having to be right all the time. Anyway, it cost me a little bit of money, lesson learned. Um, 18 years sobriety, probably one of my biggest spiritual experiences. We're in the midst of COVID. I'm completely disconnected from AA. I'm doing um, Zoom meetings, but not having any of the um, any of the fellowship. And I'm, I'm, I'm I, I can feel myself starting to boil, and I'm getting angry. And I'm, I'm overreacting at situations. I'm yelling at kids who jumped over the, the tennis courts to play tennis because this is COVID and they're not wearing masks. And what are you doing? Don't you know what you're doing? You young people. Probably the same thing older people said about me when I was young. And, and it was building and building and building. And then one day the old pressure co cooker just exploded. I'm at the dog park with my dogs. My dog gets attacked. I get into an altercation with the woman who owns the dog. She was completely, uh, yeah, so what? Who cares? You know what? You, know, you don't like it, find another dog park. Out of nowhere comes this little guy, and he's a dog walker, and he's with his two elderly dog walker lady friends, and he decides he's going to be her white knight. And he jumps in front of me and this other woman, and he chest pumps me. And a guy comes up to here. Anyway, I lost it with this kid. I never touched him, but I lost it. And um, I walked away. And then I had to come back. <laughs> <laughs> and he jumps in, and he pumps me again. And I, I told him in no uncertain terms what I was going to do to him if he did that again. And I walked away but I had to come back a third time. <laughs> and the third time, he touched up me again, and I grabbed him by the throat, and I walked him away from me. I just walked him back. And what do I hear in the background is these two elderly women dog walkers saying, you're on video, you're on video, you're on video. That's assault, that's assault. We're calling the police. And I said, oh my God, what have I done? And so... I said, okay. I said, of course I'm on video. <laughs> Why wouldn't I be? This is the 20, 25th century, isn't it? Um, so I just walked away and I said, I'll be in the park. Tell the police I'm over there. Police came. I get arrested and I get charged with assault. So here I am, 70 years old ish, and I'm being charged with assault. Old man versus young kid. Anyway. Um, that was was quite devastating. Uh, I, I just I, I was consumed with fear. What's going to happen to me? Am I going to go to jail? Um, I'm going to have a conviction. All of this stuff. Anyway, long story short, that's when I engaged my therapist and did some a lot of serious work with her. Reintroduced the concept of black and white ambiguity, and we were able to work through it to the point where um, you know I. I, I, I Basically, I was able to deal with it. I was able to get past it. And eventually, I, I got some legal uh, assistance from a neighbor who's a criminal defense attorney. And uh, he said, don't worry about it. He said, no judge is going gonna, is gonna, to uh, act on that. It'll get thrown out. It got thrown out. And so <clears throat> I put that aside and I said, okay, now what can I take away from that? And so I took those lessons that I learned.
That was a spiritual experience for me. It doesn't sound like it, but it was a spiritual experience. That's what they look like to me. There's no white light. Everything's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Nirvana, it's, it's hardship. It's pain. It's discomfort. And I, I'm, if I'm sober enough, if I'm connected enough, I'm able to take something away from it and shift. Five? Okay. So I had a couple more uh, spiritual experiences after that. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to uh, uh, move along here. At 20 years uh, of sobriety, um, I experienced more loss <clears throat> in my life. Um, my brother got diagnosed with terminal brain cancer, and my brother-in-law, who was pushing 90 and had been dealing with... Uh, MS for 25 years, uh, he died. And the, the two of them passed away within a period of two weeks. Now, I didn't experience any emotional discomfort <clears throat> from their loss. I didn't experience any deep sense of loss. But what it did from an emotional sobriety perspective, I was able to be present. I was able to step up to the plate be there for my sister-in-law, their kids. I was able to be there for my sister, who was my brother-in-law's primary caregiver until she got diagnosed with dementia. And now I had to step in and take care of my sister. So again, another, through, through some loss, some discomfort, I had to completely shift my life. This is in BC, so I spent a better part of the last two years in British Columbia taking care of my older sister. <clears throat> um, so those are the kinds of spiritual experiences that I've been through in the last 20, 21 years. The 12 and 12 says emotional, it says emotional pain is the touchstone of all spiritual growth. And that categorically has been my experience in my 21 years of recovery. Every bit of spiritual growth for me has come at my expense. You know, that seeking to get rid of change, get rid of old. It's, um, it's kind of like the, the, um, oh, I'm going to run out of time. So what's it like today? Um, I'm still a work in progress and I'm okay with that. I still know I've got a lot of work to do, but I'm excited about it because of all the positive experience and change has taken place in my life. I don't go to AA because I don't want to drink. I go to AA because I don't want to stop. I don't want to stop growing and changing. I want to continue on this journey. And my experience tells me is the only way I can do that is this program. Stay connected. Um, I don't get it right every day, but I work at it. I'm committed to the process of recovery through discovery. That's what this program is, Recovery Through Discovery. I get involved in my first big book study, uh, the big book Awakening, which is different. I needed it. I needed something different. I needed something fresh. And as a result of that, I got diagnosed as being uh, an agnostic. Why? Even though I was a Catholic altar boy, because I chose when I would trust in God. God is everything or he is nothing. I said, nah, is there not a third option? And I tried to use that third option. So I am an agnostic. Um, and I got introduced to a concept of seek God. You don't have to wake up one morning with this all-encompassing view and a complete turnover to God as your understanding. It's a journey. Discipline. I got into, introduced to discipline, which I never had. <clears throat> I've relied heavily on step 10 and 11 in the last few months. Anyway, I'm going to run out of problem uh, at a time, so I'm going to close with this. So what did they say? Run out of problems? Yeah. <laughs> Trust me. You only got the highlights. <laughs> I was going to, if I had time, I was going to share some more recent ones, but they're, they're, they'll all work out. Let me finish with this, and I'm going to read from the big book. Uh, 
First of all, we had to quit playing God. It didn't work. Next, we decided that thereafter in this drama of life, God was going to be our director. He's the principal, we are his agents. He's the father, we are his children. Most good ideas are simple, and this concept was the keystone of the new and triumphant arc through which we passed to freedom. When we sincerely took this position, all sorts of remarkable things followed. We had a new employer being all-powerful. He provided what we needed if we stay connected. His work well-established on such footing, we became less and less interested in ourselves, our little plans and designs. More and more we became interested in seeing, and this thing is powerful for me, seeing what we could contribute to life instead of what I can get out of life. As we felt new power flow in, we enjoyed peace of mind as we discovered we could face life successfully as we became conscious of his presence. We began to lose our fear of today, tomorrow, the hereafter. We were reborn. Thank you for your, for your time. Okay, thank you, Michael. And um, now for our second panelist, uh, please help me welcome Karen W. from the Prince Edward Group. I'm going to put that up there. Which one is it? I guess it's this one. Hi, everybody. I'm an alcoholic. My name's Karen. Well, I'm probably going to tell you more about how not to be emotionally sober, but, you know, <laughs> I was like, I got asked to speak on this particular panel, and I was like, I'm hoping I'm on the beam that day, because, you know, it's not every day that we get to be calm and serene and, and loving and kind. Some days I am a complete lunatic. And uh, you know what? I've learned that that's okay. You know, it's okay not to be okay all the time. Um, so I'm a member of the Prince Edward group. I have been a member at that group for I don't know how long. I can't remember. Um, my sober date is April 27th, 1989. So God willing, at the end of this April, I will be 35 years sober. Um, thank you. Honestly. It, I remember when I was new sober, very new, um, I would envision being 25 years sober. I would think, I can't wait to be that person. You know, I want to be an old timer and I want to, and I'm going to tell you two things. What you don't know when you're 23 years old and feeling like you want to be 25 years sober is that you're not going to look 23 in 25 years. <laughs> and the other thing you don't know is it's a lot shorter from this end. So embrace it. You know, I know it's exciting to get time and, and time is, we put a lot of stock in that in recovery here and truly it is one day at a time that's all it is that's it there's no way even though I dreamed it when I was younger I could have got to what I've gotten in sobriety without doing it one day at a time that's the only my emotional sobriety is dependent on the day it isn't dependent on what happened last week well sometimes it is but you know I was thinking about this, and I, I don't generally, and I'm not, I didn't today either, I don't really plan what I'm going to say when I speak. It's just, it comes from God. So if I swear it's God's fault, <laughs> I have a potty mouth. I'm sorry. I know it's going to come out. I can't help it. It's just, um, so I was thinking about something in early recovery, and I mean very early recovery. I had about a couple months sober, and I was in my mom. I had to go live with my mom. I was ordered by the courts to live with my mom. That's a, another story, but I, I, I uh, children's aid took my child, and when blah, 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 and I ended up having to um, stay with my mom under a supervision order at the beginning of my recovery, which served well. Anyway, in those days... You know, we had phone books. There was no internet. There was no, you know, telephone. There was nothing. And we had a telephone book, and I had no money, zero money, and I smoked. So I had to roll pennies. Yeah, pennies then, too. There was pennies. And and I had the, the paper. You know, the paper, I don't know. I'm probably really dating myself. But there, there, we had the paper inside the middle of the phone book, and I was lining up the pennies to, to roll to get smokes, 
because the only way I could get smokes was to roll some pennies. And it wouldn't freaking stay in the in the paper, and it kept flipping and flopping, and, you know, here I am, not very sober, not very serene, not very anything. I lost it. And I threw those pennies all over the room. Take that. I was a lunatic. That is not emotional sobriety, people. That is not what we do in recovery. But I did it. Those are the things, like when I was first new in recovery, I could not go into a, a busy, coming here to a place like this would have caused me incredible amounts of anxiety. I would go to a mall in early recovery and have to immediately use the bathroom. Don't know if anybody can relate to that, but that's what happened. I was, I was not serene inside. And the one thing I knew about when I was, when I was in active disease is that no matter where I went or what I did, from as long as I can remember, way back to when I was a kid, there was always something incredibly wrong with me, and there I wasn't enough. Those are the two standard feelings I had for my whole entire life, is that there was something wrong with me, and that I was not enough. And what I know today, after you know many rounds at the steps and many therapists and many... Um, heartfelt discussions is I am enough. I am enough. And the biggest gift I've gotten in recovery is I don't care if you like me or not. That is a miracle. Because when I was in active addiction and when I was in early recovery, I wanted you to like me. And I would put on any mask to make that happen. I was not capable of being who I was. Didn't even know who I was. You know, um, the, the theme for this convention seems to be what age you started drinking. And just really, I took away that, I don't know if anybody else saw Katie last night, but I, what I took away from that, so pathetic. How old was I? Was I 12 or was I 13? I was 13. I was 13 when I had my first alcohol experience. Um, I drank, I went babysitting, really, really responsible. And, uh, I drank the baby, the person I was babysitting for is Southern Comfort and mixed it with Dr. Pepper. And then I proceeded to finish babysitting and hit the schoolyard and throw up for hours on end. I didn't have that beautiful experience that people talk about. I, it was not fun. I was ill, really ill. But it was my first drunk, and I was 13 years old. And, you know, over the, the course of, of uh, I've met, uh, I'm from Cambridge, Ontario. There's some Cambridgers here, right? Uh, I saw, I met a few people from Cambridge this, this morning and yesterday. Um, I went to, uh, by the time I was 14 or 15, I was a full-blown alcoholic. There was no... Um, I never drank, you know, the little fruity drinks. It wasn't, wasn't my thing. I didn't have, you know, the little umbrellas. The, I had a sponsee once, and we were out, and she goes, wouldn't you just like to stop and sit at the patio and have a little fruity drink? And I'm like, it w there would be no fruity drink. It would be right out of the bottle with cigarette butts in the bottom. That's how it would be. So... <laughs> Uh, all delusional, uh, you know, all delusional thoughts about drinking are gone for me. There is no fantasizing or glorifying or, it's gone. I know what it's like. I never drank to, I always drank for oblivion. That's the way I drank. I drank to get rid of. I drank to black out. That's what I did. And I thought it was normal. I really did. I thought it was normal. And then, so by the time I was 15, I was a full-blown alcoholic. I had get, get, got kicked out of every single high school. I have a, when I got here, I had a grade nine education. Not even really. Um, anyway, I'm not going to give you a lot of that because I have a lot of sobriety and that's something I'd rather talk about. I, there's a lot more uh, good in that stuff. So when I got here, I was a mess. I couldn't roll pennies. I could I couldn't I couldn't um you know back in the day they had drapes and we had drapes so another little instance with my mom and I was putting the hooks in the drapes you put the there was pleats and you'd put the hooks in and they would line up perfectly and then you'd hang them and they'd look beautiful 
my mom says, put the hooks in the drapes. <laughs> I hung them up and they're all cockeyed. And <laughs> so I, I didn't, I couldn't, I could not settle myself down to do any one task properly. I just couldn't do it. And, you know, I had a child. That's scary. That's scary stuff. I had a child that Children's Aid was watching over me and, and I mean, that was a horrific part of my, my disease. My daughter ended up having to go into custody of Children's Aid Society for a while. And that's really what was the catalyst to get me sober. That was what, uh, started it. So my mom, God bless her. We, you know, I don't say this to make any of us feel bad, but we really don't know what we do to our people. We have no clue what we do to our people. Talk about our emotional sobriety. We kill everybody in our path with our destruction. And I say that from both ends of the story. I know that. Um, cause I'm a double winner. Woohoo! Um, anyway, so, uh, in recovery, I got to recovery. I have a spon I had a sponsor. I'm sorry. I had the same sponsor for the last 36 years. She passed away in September and I haven't been able to replace her. I haven't even tried. It's irreplaceable to, to replace that kind of relationship after a very, very long time of recovery. Not that I'm not open-minded to hearing what other people have to say. It's just, I didn't have to say anything with her. I could just call her and she'd know. And, and that's a very special relationship. That's a very, um, treasured relationship. And, and so, uh, she used to, you know, I used to spend a lot of time in the beginning of recovery phoning her up and telling her, you know, I want to drink, I want to do this, I want to do that. And she would say to me, strip a dresser. I had an old dresser. She said, strip the dresser. And I'd get off the phone and F that. She doesn't, I'm not going to strip a dresser. And then many years in, into my recovery, she said to me, hey, what happened to that dresser? I said, oh, I don't know. I threw it out. <laughs> I did, never did what I was told. I have a, a very defiant streak in me. I've always had a defiant streak. I now tame it. You know, I tame it down a little bit. I just do stupid things like I don't park where I should park. If there's rules and I can bend them a smidge, I do that. It's just in my nature. I'm not as defiant as I used to be, but I'm still defiant. I still have defiance in me. Um, you know, I've been, a, a, I've had a lot go on in my journey. So it's, it's really, uh, recovery is not a straight line. There's no, there's no straight line. It's more like, eh, 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 eh. that's how it goes. That's how it goes. And I, I hate when people say, keep coming back. It's going to get better. No, 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 not true. Keep coming back. It's going to get different. Sometimes different good and sometimes not different good. And I've had lots of both, lots of both. And I used to say, why is this happening to me? Why is this happening? Why not? It's not personal. It's life. It's life. I was seven years sober. My mom passed away. She was 56 years old. I'm actually older than she was when she died. She died of breast cancer. My mom was profoundly responsible for my journey here. Like she was profoundly responsible for me getting sober. Not that I, I didn't get sober on, you know, with the help of God, but my mom played the, a huge part. She called children's aid on her own kid. And when she passed away, I was seven years sober. And I had to thank her. You know, I didn't really get the chance to give her a proper amend. I, I didn't, it wasn't, you know, it was more of a living amend. But when she passed away, days before she passed away, I told her, you gave me life twice. Once when I, when you gave birth to me, and again when you called me that horrible telephone call to Children's Aid. And I know she heard me. And I felt that. I felt that. But I don't think I really knew what I did to my mom in terms of my behavior as an, an act of addiction until much later on in my life when my own daughter was suffering from this disease and what it did to me. Um, I got married in recovery. 
You want to test your recovery? Go ahead, get married. It's just, <laughs> you know, people have talked about it this weekend. Marriage is tough. It's hard. It's work. I want to kill them 80% of the time. I'm not like, <laughs> and there's been lots of ebbs and flows in my marriage. I've been married for 32 years. When I got into recovery, I had a male problem. I had a problem with men, too. It was just, you know, I was a lot littler then, thinner, and I was younger. And I could bat my eyelashes and get a man and go my way anytime I wanted. And I knew that. I knew that. We talk about, um, and not, to, and this is not to uh, dissuade females in recovery from talking about their being victimized. But I was, a, I was a predator. We can't just look at the men, ladies. We have to look at ourselves. I was a predator. I would go from convention to convention to convention and find men. I never had them in my hometown. Never, ever, ever in my hometown. Because that was a conflict and I couldn't have that. But I would have various relationships, if you want to call them that, in various towns. And that's what I did in recovery. And that is not emotional sobriety. I would dress like I would come to a meeting, a meeting, okay? I was just going to a meeting. I didn't need to look like a Piccadilly whore. I had, you know, a little skinny mini dress, big hair, because it was, you know, late 80s, early 90s, and I had this big kind of teased hair, and I was on the prowl. I was on the prowl, and... and you know, also not emotional sobriety. And I hit a little bottom with that in my first fourth step, which was really lovely. You know, the first fourth step I did, I was very emotionally disconnected from it because I, I acted like it was, yeah, okay, I did this, this, and this, and this, and this. No big deal. You know, I, I was very disconnected from any of my behavior. I didn't know. And you don't know when you don't know. So it takes time for me to connect, to be in touch with what, what, what and who I was. And so my first, but my first four step really did plow into that, uh, relationship crap that I was, or I wouldn't call it relationship stuff. It was just predatory behavior. That's what it was. And, you know, the danger in that, and we've heard it a million times before, I went to AA, by the way, and I was young. I was 23, and you would go into an AA meeting in my hometown in Cambridge, and in my perception, everybody was with gray hair. You would look up, and it would be a sea of blue, and I would be like, and they would say, you can't be in a relationship for your first year, and I would say, easy for you to say you're old. <laughs> I am now... Well, not really, because I'm, you know, I color, but uh, I am now the, the, the same person that I was judging when I was new in recovery. It, there wasn't the young people back then that there is now. I was definitely uh, um, well, probably the youngest person in my group at that time. And so... Um, what was my freaking point? Oh yeah. I used to phone, I used to phone my, people used to, women in recovery would come up to me and say, dear, like, they, they had good intention. You can't dress like that. You can't dress like that in recovery. And I'm like, why? You know, I don't get it. So I'd call my sponsor with big resentments and say, she told me I'm not allowed to dress like that at a meeting. And my sponsor had the beautiful line. She told me to go back and say to the lady, I didn't come here to learn how to get dressed. I came here to stop drinking. And everything else follows. Would I dress like that today? No, A, I don't have the body. And B, it's not appropriate for me. You know, I'm not on the prowl anymore. I'm a married woman. Even if I wasn't married, it would not, I'm not sure I'd come to this gene pool to find a new man. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, fast forward. I'm going to fast forward. I don't know how much time I have left, so I, 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 um, I have seven minutes. Okay, so um, let's let's move it up a bit. 
I went, okay, some of the things I didn't recover, just so you know, you know, these are things. I had a grade nine education, remember? I, I went to school. I went to university. And I got to go as a mature student. Luckily, I read a lot when I was a kid and I had a little bit of um, smarts. So I managed to pass an aptitude test and write an essay to get me in. I have a very big gift as a writer. I'm proud to say that. I used to be embarrassed by that, but now I am proud to say that. Writing comes to me very naturally. And so it's a gift. And so if I have that gift and I use it, that's great. Some gifts I don't have. I can't, I, you know, I can't hammer anything. I'm horrible at it. Um, so I went to university. I got a career. I did the AA hiatus at 10 years sober. I, I call it my AA hiatus. I got incredibly crazy. Between 10 and 15 years sober, I did not go to any meetings at all. I was busy with my career. I had two kids. I was busy. And AA took a back seat for a while. I still, and I, I would justify it by saying, well, I still call my sponsor. And she'd say, did you go to a meeting? And I'd say, no, I don't have time. And she would say, you know, it's not all about you. Well, yes, it is. Yes, it is. My first thought and reaction to anything, this is, a, this is an emotional sobriety thing for me. My first reaction to anything, anything, is what about me? You could fall and stub your toe, and I would say, oh, my God, what about me? How does this affect me? What does it do for me? Am I, me, 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 me. Now, today, I can go to thought too. I still get what, what, what about me? I still think it. I still feel it. But now I can go to thought too. And sometimes thought three, and it's not always just about me, which is a miracle. It's a miracle because we have a disease that's self-centered to the core. Um, so what else did I do? I got a career. I didn't go to meetings. I went stark raving nuts. My, then my daughter started uh, behaving like us, and uh, I started chasing her around and hiding behind trees and, you know, doing things that us codependent part of me does. I'm not really sure what came first, to, me, to be honest with you. I, I'm both. I think, to be honest, if I'm being honest, I think all of us are both. It's just when is it going to rear its ugly head because it ain't fun. Um, so at, at 30 years sober, I'm in a really fast track now. I had, and, and Chris last night was talking about this, if you saw Chris, I had a emotional breakdown I, like you would not have believed. 2018, I was drooling. I, I'm, I'm exaggerating a smidge, but I was not, I would go, this is what my day would look like. I could not function as a human being. I could not. I would get up. I had a career. My, I'm self-employed, so I got a little leeway. And I would lie on the couch, and I would listen to one, I, I forget the name of the meditations, but I, there was a YouTube meditation, and I would turn on the YouTube t on the TV, and I would do one meditation right after the other for hours. My husband would, and I do, I practice Reiki. I'm not sure if anybody knows what, so I have my second degree in Reiki because when I was new in sobriety and even today, my brain would race so quickly, so fast. And this was not good for my emotional self. And that Reiki taught me the practice of it to shut that head up, to shut it up. Because, you know, I hear a speaker years ago, years and years ago, is like, ask your brain one thing when it's racing like that. What is your source of information? It has no clue. It has no clue. But my brain used to race like that, and I practiced Reiki to slow it down. And so when I hit this emotional breakdown that I had, and it was huge, it was huge, that, that racing came back again. It came back full speed. And so what ended up happening is I had to go on some medication, and it took me months and months and months to get over it. Thanks. Um, I got two minutes, so now I'm going to... I don't have a profound ending. I really don't. I, I really think um, the gift of Alcoholics Anonymous, I am everything I am because of this program, including the bad and the good 
Because just because I've got 35 years sober, 34 years and some change, does not mean I don't mess up, because I mess up every day. Sometimes extremely and sometimes not. But emotional sobriety for me is to be able to accept what life throws at me on life's terms. And for the most part, I can do that. I am not a reactive, I'm not, a, I don't have reactions like I used to. I don't get pissed as quickly as I used to. My fuse was this big when I was in early recovery, and now it's probably this big, which is a big difference, which is a big difference. You know, we have a profound psychic change that happens to us over time. It does not happen in six days or 20 years or 10 years. It happens over time, and it never stops happening. And I am incredibly grateful to the committee for asking me to come and participate today. And I am a little surprised with the amount of people that are in the room, I'm not going to lie. Um, but thank you all for listening, and have a great rest of the convention. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.